Sophia and uh, and then Thank you for all of us uh, joining this meeting this, uh, this day. So today I'm going to talk to you about the geometric inverse problem, which has the flavor in, a, in an anisotropic wave equation. And just to highlight that this talk is in a, a part of a joint work with Martin de Hoop at Rice University, Jonas Ilmavirta at Tampere University, and Matti Lassas at University of Helsinki. So what is the goal of my, my talk that I want to try to uh, address today is that can we recover some uh, material properties of an unknown elastic object by measuring the travel times of uh, two different types of waves. So first of all, we have, I'm talking a bit about the problem that we are sending waves from boundary uh, of my object and then they travel through the object and then I have some measurement devices where I measure when the wave arrives on the other side of the domain. So we have this kind of like direct transition that we are, we are studying. And then the main part of the talk will be this kind of like a scatter situation that we are sending waves from the boundary, they propagate inside the body, and then there is a scattering point where they will scatter and then return back to the, uh, the boundary at some other point where we measure how long uh, is the total travel time of this, this scattered waves. Of course, this is now a mathematical talk. So we have these kind of uh, uh, mathematical uh, assumptions. So for instance, we do the assumption that we can send waves anywhere we want. So we can send many waves from different positions. And then what we do that we can record the waves in anywhere at the boundary where we wish. And then we also have the assumption that the waves do not reflect uh, from the surface of the, uh, of the body, but kind of like kind of disappear or exit after that. So what is our goal is to recover some geometric quantities from this type of travel time measurements, which should be coordinate invariant. And maybe at this point I want to highlight, so please, if you have any questions or I wasn't very clear about something, please unmute yourself and just ask a question whenever you feel so. But this is now the, the goal, what I want to do. And in particular, the focus will be in this type of situation where we have waves that scatter once uh, inside some unknown point scatterer. So the outline of the talk is the following. So first we talk about sound waves, a bit of a warm up situation. And now our model will be Riemannian, uh, Riemannian geometry. Then we go to the main model of the talk today, uh, which would be about elastic waves. And then the last part of the talk will be about solving the inverse problem. Uh, in particular, what we are going to solve an inverse problem of a broken scattering relation on compact Pinster manifolds. But let's start with the, with the sound waves and Riemannian geometry. So what is the measurement that we are, we are doing? So we are now assuming that we have a compact smooth Riemannian manifold MG with, uh, uh, with uh, smooth boundary. And now our model for the waves is the scalar wave equation on Riemannian manifold, where this uh, delta is the Laplace Beltrami operator related to uh, metric G. So then our, uh, uh, what we are measuring are the waves which we send from the boundary. So now F is some boundary source, which we con can control freely. So let's, for instance, assume that it's a smooth, uh, smooth complex supported function on the boundary. And we do the assumption that before time zero, the everything is in a, in, a, is a, in a still position, okay? So now what is the measurement that we do? So now let's first fix a measurement point Z here on the boundary. And then uh, let's think about now just that we choose some, uh, some um, boundary source F and we send a wave UF corresponding to that boundary source through the medium. And now what is the measurement is the travel time. So now in particular, this first line here just says that now our measurement is the first time when in some neighborhood of this point Z, we can, um, uh, we can measure the arriving wave coming in. So this would be now the time how, how long particular for this wave it takes to travel uh, to point, point C. Of course, with only one wave, we cannot do so much about the geometric situation. But now if we also set up some, uh, let's say, uh, set gamma on the boundary where we are sending the waves, then now if we look at like all waves that are whose boundary source is supported in this set, uh, set gamma on the boundary, and now we take the infimum of all those waves uh, having that support condition, 
that uh, come here to this point C, then actually now uh, first what we notice that this uh, tau uh, of gamma C is now by the uh, finite speed of propagation at most the same as the distance from this point C to this um, uh, measure, uh, like sending set uh, gamma. And now actually just using the unit continuation principle, one can actually see that this is uh, not an equality, this is actually an equality. And now uh, if then we, well, what is the next step now, if we have now some point W inside this set gamma, and now we shrink the set gamma uh, to this point, we collapse the uh, set gamma to this point W, then in the limit, what we will get is actually the Riemannian distance between these points uh, W and Z. And this is, this is now the travel time measurement that we are doing. But uh, before like going, getting into inverse problems, let's think about a bit different formalism, how we can think about, uh, how we can think about this travel time. So uh, now if we are looking at uh, manifolds which are convex, meaning that any two points can be connected by a unique uh, uh, geodesic, then uh, the Hamiltonian formalism uh, related to this uh, wave equation, of course, gives us information about this travel time. So now just to recall that the principal symbol of this uh, Riemannian wave equation has this form over here. So now in particular, the uh, important piece of that is the spatial uh, component, uh, this guy over here, where this Gij is just the inverse of the Riemannian uh, metric G, which is our unknown. So uh, in particular, if we want to now understand how long it takes for waves to travel from point to point, we should focus on this uh, Hamiltonian, uh, Hamiltonian G and then look at that uh, by characteristic curves of that, uh, that, that Hamiltonian flow, uh, Hamiltonian. And in particular, now the by characteristic curves of this, this Hamiltonian are uh, curves in the cotangent bundle of M where the spatial component is nothing more than a geodesic of this uh, metric G. So now how we can write again this travel time data of ours. So now let's assume that we have again two boundary points W and Z. And then what we look at, we are looking at uh, any integral curve of G uh, such that, that the spatial component uh, of that integral curve connects these two points. So now the X curve would be this guy over here. And now uh, what we do is that now the travel time, which is just the Riemannian distance, between those uh, two points is that first we take, we long take for each curve connecting these two points, we take the length of this curve, which is given by this first uh, parenthesis here. And then we take the infimum over all these curves having this condition. And in this way, we can get the, uh, the travel time of, uh, uh, of the curves or the distance between these two points. So in particular, when we go into the elastic setting, this Hamiltonian formalism is the one that we want to focus on. But anyway, so now what is the inverse problem? So this is very classical problem. So the question is that can we recover this unknown uh, Riemannian metric if we know the travel times between any pair of boundary points? And this is, of course, as I said, like very classical inverse problem. And, and in a geometry, it's known as a boundary rigid uh, problem where the assumption uh, is the following. So now let's assume that we have some uh, compact Riemannian manifold M, which has the smooth boundary and two re unknown Riemannian metrics G1 and G2. Having the uh, assumption such that, that the boundary distance function of these two curves are the same. So of course, now this means that for two different metrics, a geodesic connecting Z to W might be, might be a different curve, but the length of this geodesic is the same. So that's the, that's the assumption over, uh, over here. And now what is the classical inverse problem when, uh, uh, well, in a geometric terms, of course, the best thing that you can do is to try to recover the isometric class of the, of the Riemannian ma uh, manifold. And now the question is that of course, like uh, having this uh, assumption for the boundary distance function, does that imply that there must exist a Riemannian uh, isometry phi from uh, MG1 to MG2, that is an identity on the boundary. And if that type of uh, uh, isometry exists, 
then we say that this manifold M is boundary, boundary rigid. Unfortunately, of course, not all manifolds are, uh, are boundary rigid. So there is a vast class of manifolds which are, are not like that. So now, for instance, so what is uh, the setting is that we are sending uh, geodesics from boundary to some other boundary points. And now this kind of means that what we don't have is some uh, interior information. So now in particular, if there inside our manifold is some very slow area, such that it's always faster to connect two boundary points by going around this low area, then in particular, our uh, boundary distance function doesn't provide us information about this low area, which means that here in this area, we are free to change our, our Riemannian metric in a, in a small way, such that we create now a non-isometric family of Riemannian metrics, which all have the same boundary distance function. So in particular, this would be a, a, like non-uniqueness for, for the result. So uh, of course, like this was a well-known fact that not all manifolds are boundary rigid. So let's try to pursue some better geometries how this problem could be solvable. And maybe the first example how could, this could be uh, tracked is to consider the class of manifolds which are simple. So a manifold, a compact Riemannian manifold is simple if the boundary is strictly convex, which essentially now means that if I take a geodesic, which would be tangential to boundary, then it stays outside the domain for a finite sum to both directions. Also, we do the assumption that each pair of, the, each pair of point inside the manifold can be connected by a unique distance minimizing geodesic. So under these two assumptions, uh, a compact Riemannian manifold is, is simple. And first, like uh, a result of like trying to like characterize manifolds with boundary distance function having this, this type of assumption is due to Michel from uh, 81, uh, where in a paper where he also conjectured that every simple uh, Riemannian manifold would be boundary rigid. Uh, of course, I know that there are many people here in this audience who are, who are like uh, experts in this topic. And I apologize that I cannot now refer uh, all the uh, results, but let me say that this is uh, still an unsolved problem in, in general for 3D and higher, but maybe just to say that for 2D case, this problem has been completely solved by best of an Ullman in uh, 2005. And for instance, uh, any uh, uh, like generic Riemann, a simple Riemann manifold is bounded to a result by Stefanovan and Ullman. So uh, what kind of like other conditions have been uh, considered lately? And this is something that I will now focus in my talk too, is this type of convex foliations. So this means that we assume that there is a smooth function M, uh, F uh, from the manifold to some uh, positive real interval, which uh, has non-vanishing uh, gradients. And now the foli convex foliation means just that that when you are looking at each level set of this function, then this is now supposed to be a strictly convex surface for uh, any uh, S, which is not the maximum value S over here. And very nice result a few years ago by Stefan of Ullmann and Vashi is that where he proved that every foliated three-dimensional or higher dimensional Riemannian manifold is always, uh, always boundary rigid. And now, uh, in, in, as I said, like in, my, in this talk, we try to focus on these type of conditions in a, in a Finster case. Okay, so anyway, uh, what, what I, I guess like what is my feeling why this boundary question in general is so, is so difficult, it's because we have such a small data. So essentially we are only sending so, uh, having sources on the boundary uh, and that makes it difficult to have any interior information uh, from the manifold. So now what I'm going to propose that what we can look at like, so, okay, let's look at a bit more general geometries, but let's now assume that we have more richer data. So in particular, uh, we, we are looking this time, these broken geodesics. And what's the idea with broken geodesic is that we now try to create interior point sources inside the manifold, and that will solve us the full uh, uh, in the inverse problem of determining uh, the material parameters. So, but first about the more general geometry. So we are now going to focus on elastic case and in particular, uh, we, are, we are looking at Finster geometry. So, but what is the, the elastic uh, wave equation? So now 
we are looking at uh, a smooth domain M inside uh, a smooth bounded domain M inside R3. And now we assume that we are given some uh, elastic tensor C, which is a four tensor field on the, uh, uh, on the uh, domain M, which now describes our elastic parameter, elast elastic properties of this medium. And now the model that we have for elastic waves is this anisotropic elastic wave equation, which is given in the following way in a Cartesian coordinates. And now the only thing which is important to notice is that in contrast to Riemannian case, this unknown function u is now a vector field. So, so this makes this nature of this equation very different to this former scalar equation that I was talking about. But we do same kind of like setting that we have, we are sending like uh, waves from the boundary of the domain, having the assumption that before time zero, the domain is, uh, is at the still position. So uh, now if we want to look at the Hamiltonian formalism related to this type of setting. So now what we note first is that the principal symbol of this elastic wave equation uh, is this guy here. Uh, where in particular this uh, time component or the dual of the time component is nothing particular, it's just a diagonal matrix uh, scaled with this omega squared. But now uh, the, uh, the spatial component is something more interesting. So this is now a matrix valued smooth mapping uh, from the um, uh, cotangent bundle of M uh, to uh, to scalar uh, sc uh, to, to matrix uh, matrices. And now in particular, this matrix is called Christopher matrix, and it has this kind of, uh, this kind of like form. So in particular, it's now polynomial of order two in these uh, momentum variables P. And it's symmetric uh, matrix because uh, due to this uh, assumption that we had here for the symmetries of the matri uh, elastic tensor. So let's try. Uh, so we would like to understand the Hamiltonian formalism related to this guy. But now, of course, the annoying thing is that this is, is this is a matrix-valued function, not a scalar-valued function. So we have to now somehow diagonalize this uh, this Christopher matrix to get into the Hamiltonian picture. And that's what the next slide is about. So uh, since this Christopher matrix is symmetric, it has three uh, uh, eigenvalues, which can be assumed to be all or positive, uh, positive eigenvalues. And these are now uh, uh, positive functions on uh, positive continuous functions on the cotangent bundle of R3. And now we do this, uh, this assumption, which is usually like very well uh, uh, holds true in, in, in a physics. So we assume that there is one eigenvalue, which is strictly larger than the two, two other ones. So now in, in this picture, the level set of this largest eigenvalue, when you fix the X and you look at just like a, a cotangent space at, at X would be this, um, so a level set, set of one of this G1 would be the blue uh, circle over here. And the very nice uh, uh, thing about this level set that we can notice already from the picture is that uh, this set is convex. So meaning in particular that this, uh, this convexity now gives us that this guy actually can be seen as a Minkowski norm on, on, the, uh, on, on the cotangent bundle. And this is, uh, makes this, uh, in particular, this type of uh, waves, which are the quasi P waves, very easy to, to study or easier to study than the other ones. So now, uh, in contrast, if we are looking at the, the smaller eigenvalues, which are these green and red uh, areas here, so now what we note is that, uh, that these guys usually uh, always intersect in a non-empty way, meaning that now uh, for these S waves, uh, there is like uh, non-smoothness in these kind of uh, uh, areas, plus these uh, level sets might not be convex, which means that now, of course, we cannot really rely on any nice geometric formalism in, in, in this case. So that's why uh, we are now only focusing for this innermost uh, eigenvalue related to uh, quasi P waves in anisotropic media or pressure waves in isotropic media. And as I, as I said, now in particular, this uh, largest eigenvalue is a smooth function in the cotangent bundle. And uh, the nice thing is that the Hamiltonian flow related to this, uh, this H is actually a co-geodesic flow of some uh, Finster metric, which I will describe 
in the next slide. But anyway, so what are these quasi P waves? Well, they are solutions of this uh, 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 pseudo differential equation over here. And now what we are doing, doing, trying to do is to measure the travel times of this type of waves. So the problem that is now a recast of the uh, Riemannian problem in the first slides is that can we recover this uh, largest eigenvalue G1 if we know the travel times of all these quasi P waves which pass through this uh, medium M. And just to now note that, okay, this is now in some sense the same problem uh, as the boundary rigidity problem in a, in a Riemannian case, but now we are looking at Finster matrix. And unfortunately, there is a, a result by Sergei Ivanov by 2013 that there just are way too many Finster metrics that they can be uh, detected by uh, the boundary distance function. So in general, simple Finster manifolds are not boundary rigid, but of course now this elastic Finster metric G1 is somehow very particular one. So now what could be like the hope what, uh, what in the long run we would like to, to, to study is that is this type of like uh, uh, Finster metric uh, detectable or uniquely uh, detectable by the boundary distance function or not. Okay, but what are these Finster, uh, Finster uh, manifolds? So now uh, we say that the continuous function from tangent bundle uh, to positive real axis is a Finster metric. If, uh, for, uh, for instance, the first condition is that, uh, that the, uh, the function needs to be uh, smooth outside the zero section, then it has to be uh, positive homogeneous of order one with respect to the directional variable V and the most important property which makes it like a nice Minkowski norm is that we have to uh, assume that the Hessian of directional variables uh, given by this formula over here is symmetric and positive definite. So now in particular this Gij which is uh, this guy over here is now kind of like a Riemannian metric. So it, it works as, as a positive definite matrix, but now the important thing to notice is that in general, this, uh, this local Riemannian metric G is still depending on the directional vari uh, variable. So this, uh, this is more complicated uh, a creature than a general Riemannian metric. Then also something that I want to highlight that this condition two now, uh, doesn't uh, like uh, doesn't uh, give like symmetry for for the Finster metric. So in, in general, Finster metrics are not symmetric in this uh, in this sense for uh, for directional variables. And maybe the last thing I want to emphasize about about Finster metrics is that uh, a Finster function is Riemannian if and only if this local uh, uh, Riemannian metric is directionally independent. So, uh, and in particular, now what we are going to concentrate are these non-Riemannian Finster functions. And these elastic Finster functions are uh, non-Riemannian. So how do we measure distances on a Finster manifold? So it's done in exactly the same way as in a Riemannian case. So let's choose two points on the, on the Finster manifold. And then what we do, then we connect them by, let's say, C1 smooth curve. So now this this Finster metric gives us a way to measure the velocity of the curve connecting these two points and then just integrating over the, the speed of the curve, we get the length of the curve in the same way as in a Riemannian case. And then when we take the infimum over all those C1 curves connecting the points, we get the Riemannian dis uh, the Finster distance exactly in the same way as in a Riemannian case. However, in general, and this Finster distance function is not symmetric uh, distance function. So uh, it sat uh, satisfies this type of condition. And this is due to the fact that the Finster metric itself uh, uh, is, is not necessarily symmetric. So, uh, but now uh, nice thing about these elastic Finster functions is that they are uh, always uh, symmetric. And therefore in elastic case, also the distance function is symmetric. And therefore, now in this talk, we are going to focus on that type of Finster metrics, which have this symmetric distance function. Okay, so now we have an idea, what is the models, what are the models that we are interested in? So let's uh, focus on the, on the inverse problem, what we are trying to solve. 
So uh, now uh, let's recall what's the idea is that now we have a uh, we have a now a, a smooth manifold with boundary and we are sending waves uh, from any uh, subset of the manifold and what we are measuring we are measuring now the arrival times of the waves to to any point inside the boundary so of course the very like let's say the fundamental problem would be trying to solve this direct uh, uh, direct problem where we are sending waves and then we are measuring the waves we travel through the manifold uninterrupted but as i mentioned that now this is essentially the finsterian version of uh, the boundary rigidity problem so this is too difficult for me to, to work on so now what i'm going to propose is that like, let's look at like a bit more simplified situation where we are sending waves uh, from anywhere on the manifold then they scatter from some uh, unknown uh, point scatterer and reflect back on the boundary and now what is our measurement is that we measure how long it took for this scattered wave to travel uh, without knowing when the scattering happened. Then we know like where and to which direction this uh, wave was shot uh, inside. And then we know the exiting uh, direction and exiting point for this wave. And now if we can do this, uh, three type, this, these three measurements for any uh, quasi P wave, then the hope is uh, that we can recover this largest eigenvalue uh, by this, uh, this thing up to uh, uh, change of coordinates. Okay, so what does this mean now in a geometric term? So what is our actually me actual measurement? And this is called a broken scattering relation. So now uh, let MF be a compact symmetric Finster manifold. Now no symmetric means that F uh, of V is the same as F of minus b and then what we what is now this, this relation so now for each t which is a positive number we define a relation r of t on the inward pointing bundle on the boundary so now two uh, inward pointing vectors and points are in this relation uh, with each other if there exists some positive times t1 and t2 such that that these two times sum up to be the time t and moreover when i'm looking this uh, this corresponding geodesic related to x1 uh, v1 and x2 v2 these two point uh, geodesic need to intersect in, in a common point given by by this condition here so what is our recording so we we know this entering point here and this entering point here and we know the total travel time uh, of this broken geodesic, but we don't know these two times individually, or we don't know where this intersection is happening. So we only have a, a information on the boundary and for, uh, for the total travel times. And of course, now we do the same recording for each possible uh, number t. Okay. So the problem that we try to address is that can we recover this unknown Finsterometric uh, F modulo Finsterian isometry from this family of relations. And uh, this, this problem has been of course uh, studied earlier in a, in a Riemannian case and about 10 years ago, uh, Kurilev, Lassas and Ullmann showed that if uh, your uh, Finsterometric is Riemannian, then only the restriction that they have is that the dimension has to be three or higher, but in this case, these, uh, these relations uh, uniquely determine the, the, met, uh, the Riemannian metric. So they don't need to pose any conditions for the, uh, for the curvature or, uh, or, or, or simplicity or anything like that. So any compact manifold can be characterized uh, by this, this relation. In our uh, Finster case, this is not uh, quite true. And I try to now explain what is the extra condition that we pose. So uh, we, we are looking at these Finster manifolds which satisfy this convex foliation condition. And just to recall, what is a convex foliation condition? So uh, in a Finster manifold, so now we assume that there exists some smooth function, smooth function F on the, on the, on the manifold such that that uh, uh, I get about, uh, so the level set of zero is the boundary, and then uh, 
then uh, the interior of the manifold is given by this set and then uh, more one one condition more is that for this maximum value of f uh, this this uh, level set has an empty interior and then the convexity just means that for each s uh, in this interval the corresponding uh, level set is strictly convex with respect to the fin stereometry and now uh, there are several ways of characterizing this uh, strictly convexity, but maybe the easiest one with, uh, in a geometric intuition is that if I now take a point from this level set and any direction which is tangential to this direction, then corresponding geodesic, this uh, dotted uh, red line over here, stays outside the super level set over here. Uh, of course, like there is a long history, especially in, in, a, uh, in in geophysics, to study like uh, uh, manifolds which have like this kind of convex foliation conditions, and maybe the most uh, well-known one is about 100 years ago. Ago, like if one studies uh, radial wave speed on 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 some Euclidean domain, uh, such that this uh, this wave speed is conformal to Euclidean metric, which just depends on the depth depth in this uh, unit circle. So uh, in uh, in this case, uh, if um, if this, this wave speed satisfies this classical Herklotz condition given over here, then for instance, then this C gives us a foliation, a convex foliation uh, of the manifold. So now in particular, what we are now trying to look at is generalizations of this type of uh, conditions. So what is our, uh, our main theorem? Well, uh, it's the following. So that if M, uh, F is a compact symmetric Finster manifold, of dimension three or higher having a boundary. And if we know the Finster structure uh, at the boundary and this manifold has this strictly convex uh, uh, foliation condition, then this uh, family of this broken scatter relations determine this manifold uh, modular Finster isometry. And I think this is quite nice result because ju just to, to, to recall that, for instance, uh, by this result by Ivanov says that uh, a Finster manifold is not uh, uh, uniquely recovered by the uh, boundary distance function. So having this uh, uh, more data, uh, like larger data set, you are actually able to do uh, this, this recovery uniquely. So how does the, the proof of this, this, uh, this result work? And this will be now uh, the last, uh, last topics that I will, will talk. So, uh, uh, so now the first thing that we need to remember uh, is that now any interior point P can be uh, represented uh, by, uh, by closest boundary point CP and the distance uh, to, the, to the boundary. So this is called uh, so-called boundary normal coordinates. So, and there are several types of points. So for instance, this green point over here would be a point for which there is only one uh, closest boundary point, which now gives the distance from this green point to the boundary. Then there are like uh, points which are lying in the boundary cut locus of the manifold, which would be this red line over here. So for instance, for this blue point over here, like there are now at least two or more like closest boundary points. So this, this representation is not unique, but not, luckily this uh, boundary cut lock is always uh, of measure zero uh, set in the manifold. So what we try to now do first is to do some sort of a recovery uh, uh, in, uh, in this boundary, uh, boundary normal coordinates. So what do we do? So now uh, let's choose boundary point Z0, which in this picture would, would be this point over here. And now some time T0. Uh, and then what we do, we follow that geodesic uh, into that time. And it, this would be this, uh, this black dot over here. So what we try to do is now let's try to find uh, a family uh, of, of, of all those uh, all those uh, re, uh, geodesics that start from some direction WZ. So this WZ is now a vector field on the boundary. And we try to now recover, uh, like try to see like if this WZ exists and, and there is some like uh, focusing time uh, TC such that, that all these, uh, uh, all these like uh, uh, rays 
given with respect to this initial condition and this focusing time actually need this red uh, normal reference uh, geodesic at this fixed fixed point. So this is the first test to see like if I'm being given this uh, entering direction and this focusing time, then of course by uh, by the relation what I can see, I can see if uh, if this relation is valid or not. But the relation itself doesn't tell if the focusing is happening at this uh, particular one point or, or is it happening like for e each ray in some individual points. So the first task is to say that given this type of vector field and this focusing time, then uh, if this initial uh, time t0 is small enough, then actually the focusing will be of this sort as in this picture. So then the next step, what we, what we try to do is uh, de de determine uh, the exit time. So for, if I take any, any geodesic, let's say this guy, then how long uh, does this geodesic stay inside the manifold? And of course, now this is just like the largest T such that, that this vector is in the relation uh, with itself. So in that sense, this, uh, this broken scattering relation also determines as the exit time how long geodesic stay inside the manifold. Then uh, the last thing that we now try to now recover is this uh, boundary cut distance function. So in particular, that's the, the distance from a boundary point like this guy to this red set over here, where we have several uh, closest boundary points. So, so we want to recover where, where this red line could lie. Okay, so now uh, what we try to now turn is we try to turn these focusing families into interior source points in, uh, in the following way. So what we try to recover is now that when I give, um, when I give like an interior point P, what I now want to find is the, the distance function from this interior point to any boundary point Q. Uh, and if, uh, and that, that kind of now turns this uh, interior point uh, as a source point that we can then uh, continue on, on our analysis. But uh, as I said, like now only a, a tool where we can work is this boundary normal coordinates. So now first we've been given this point Q, which is this red point over here. And now we try to find this, uh, write this point P in boundary normal coordinates. So this set Z zero, which would be point here, is now the closest boundary point and T zero is now the, the distance from this closest boundary point uh, to, to point P over here, okay? So, uh, and now do the previous slide, what we can now re, uh, find is like we can over, if I'm given a vector field V on the boundary and this focusing time, I can now always know uh, if this kind of like actual focusing is happening or not. So what is the hope? So now we assume uh, we use the assumption that uh, our boundary is convex. So now in particular, what does it mean? It means that the distance minimizing curve gamma, uh, which uh, goes from Q to P and has the initial direction eta is actually a geodesic. So without convexity, this, this wouldn't be true, but now in a convex case, this uh, this distance minimizing curve from uh, uh, Q uh, to P uh, is, is a geodesic. And this is very important because our relation is only telling about stuff, uh, uh, only tell, telling about geodesics. It's not telling anything about general curves, but just geodesics. And now what we notice from this picture is that now if I give you this focusing family, uh, which is just this, uh, these uh, curves focusing at this a blue point. So now in particular, this red curve here, which is the distance minimizing curve between Q and P is in relation with all these curves over here. And now what, what we try to now show uh, as a part of the paper is that, okay, so now uh, if we look at all those uh, uh, directions eta at point Q, such that, uh, that there exists now this kind of focusing family, such that it is in relation uh, with each of these uh, vector fields. So now uh, we know that uh, because of the convexity that the distance minimizing geodesic would be in this set. So now what we just do is we take the infimum over all those uh, S's where this 
uh, th this focusing uh, happens. And now uh, after some computations, what can one can show is that now the distance, bound, uh, distance between P uh, and this boundary point Q is just the infimum of all these S's over here. So what we have recovered so far, we have now uh, recovered uh, that for any interior point P, we know the distance function to any boundary point Q. So any inter for any interior point P, we know uh, the distance function uh, to the boundary. And now in particular, what does it mean? We have now recovered the boundary distance data, which means that we know the geometry of the, of the boundary. And then we know this family uh, of boundary distance functions uh, for, for any interior point. So uh, actually now the Riemannian proof would end here because uh, a result by Slava Kurilev shows that actually this set is enough to recover the Riemannian manifold. But in the Pinsler case, uh, this is just like a, a, a just a, an intermission. So now starts a new, new act. So uh, what we did like few years ago with Martin, Jonas and Matti, we studied this type of data on, on, a, uh, on a Pinsler manifold. And uh, what we noticed is that now, uh, if you think about this distance function, so now if my interior point P looks like this guy over here, and this blue set here would be the boundary of the manifold. Now taking gradients of this distance function, what do we recover is actually only information of those geodesics which come to the boundary in the distance minimizing way. So, uh, and this set of like geodesics which come in uh, this boundary in this way is denoted by this set uh, GMF. Uh, so, uh, but now of course, like there might be some geodesics which would be for instance trapped inside the manifold. So these kind of geodesics uh, won't, uh, we don't have any information about them or just looking at this data over here. And now the important thing is that the Finster manifold metric is, is also dependent on, on these directions. So it's not enough to recover the metric to these directions. We need to do something to catch these guys. And the result, uh, uh, what we had a few years earlier is that, okay, so now this boundary distance data, what it does, it recovers uh, the topological structure of the manifold and uh, the smooth structure of the manifold. Then uh, what we can also do is that we can recover this uh, unknown Pinster metric in this set of uh, minimizing directions, but not outside it. So just from the boundary distance data, uh, uh, we cannot like, uh, we can actually manipulate our Pinster metric in a, in a small way to get a non-isometric family of, uh, of, of uh, Pinster metrics for which this data coincide. And now uh, to, to, you, uh, to get past this issue, we will use the uh, foliation condition. So uh, now just to recall what is the foliation condition. So it's given here in this, this top box. So now in particular, uh, the important thing is that we assume that the boundary is convex and that for each uh, S, the level set uh, of S is a strictly convex smooth surface inside the, the boundary. And now what type of peeling argument we use? So first we use the fact that the boundary uh, is convex, which means that there exists some epsilon, which is a positive number such that, that for any interior point uh, P, which is epsilon close to the boundary, then uh, there exists a hemisphere of directions such that, that when I shoot a geodesic to any of these directions over here, then these geodesics are distance minimizing to the boundary. So the convexity of the boundary says that this uh, uh, hemisphere at P is at, uh, at least the hemisphere at P is contained in this set where we already can determine our Pinsler metric. So now what we use next is the symmetry. So that because this Pinsler metric is symmetric, then uh, we, if we know uh, the uh, the metric to this direction, then we can also compute it to this uh, uh, negative direction too. Okay, so in particular, we, we can now recover the whole Finster metric in some neighborhood of the, uh, of the boundary. 
And then we start to use the, uh, the foliation condition. So uh, this is now uh, the, the area where just using the connective boundary where we can recover the thin symmetric would be now this area between black and, and blue curve. So now, uh, in particular, this, this blue curve is now given as a level set of some uh, number s, which now depends on this epsilon parameter that we, that we have over here. So the step that we do is that now our original data was this, uh, uh, this broken scattering relation in the original manifold, on the boundary of the original manifold. So what we will do is that we use the foliation to create this artificial boundary uh, inside the manifold. And then the nice thing with this broken scattering relation is that this data can be actually now uh, transformed uh, to broken scattering relation of this smaller blue manifold over here. So we can now uh, actually also recover uh, the broken uh, scattering relation of the smaller manifold. And then we just repeat uh, this, uh, this, this uh, Feeling argument and get smaller and more smaller subsets, and after a finitely many steps, we can actually recover uh, the finger structure inside uh, inside the manifold. So uh, just to, to note, so this talk was based on on two uh, two manuscripts where the let's say the main one is about this broken scattering relation, uh, uh, which was done in collaboration with Martin de Hoop, Jonas Ilmavirta, and Matti Lassas. So uh, this was the main, the main result of, of the talk, but of course, this heavily relies on this uh, earlier paper by uh, Marta, Jonas, Matti, and I, where we studied this uh, inverse problem for this boundary distance, uh, called the boundary distance data, and, and did this earlier work where we noticed that which is the optimal set where we can uh, recover the, the Pinster structure. Uh, but I thank you guys very much for your attention and please ask any questions if you have. Thank you very much, Temu, for the very nice talk. Are there any questions or comments? Are there any questions or comments? Okay, uh, hi, this is Rakesh. I, I have a question. Uh, so uh, my understanding is the motivation for studying these problems perhaps is, well, as you said, for the elasticity problem, and uh, this having interior, you know, reflection mm -hmm. regions is sort of like studying the linearized inverse problem mm -hmm. for the elasticity. So this seems like you want to generate sources in the in or reflecting regions in the interior everywhere. Yes. Like so, can you make a connection with the elasticity problem, and how would you generate these reflecting things inside? Uh, did you have some, did you, is that, is this that the motivation? Like, is it something related to a nonlinear problem, nonlinear forward problem or something or? So, yes. So, so in, in, in sense like that, what would be the motivation, uh, is like this, this travel time problem in, uh, in, in elasticity. So that's true, but of course now what we, basically did in the, in the paper is that we are not now able to basically give you a reconstruction formula for this largest eigenvalue, but we can recover the isometric class of this largest eigenvalue. And uh, of course, like now what we are doing, we are, as you said, like generating these point sources in the interior, uh, but uh, of, of course, this is kind of like also is this just a trick that we, we use in, in a geometric way of assuming that they do exist, but uh, this basically now violates the smoothness of this, this G1. So this is kind of like gluing two things together, but it's not really a waste still to recover this, this G1. Okay. All right, yeah, thanks. Thank okay. you. Oh, yeah, good question too. Yes, sir. Hi, okay, okay. Uh, so I have a related question also about those sources. I mean, uh, you, you want one source at a time, I guess. Uh, if you have too many sources, then there'll be nothing left and there'll be multiple reflections. And I, I call them sources, but you call them obstacles. 
And if there's a delta type of obstacle, then uh, it may be very well invisible to the waves of finite length at least. So it's a question how do you even model infinitely small obstacles. So my understanding is this is coming from a seismology where you have uh, earthquakes uh, randomly occurring in different places. And then this is how you collect this information. But if yes. you talk about uh, obstacles, I mean, you really have to have one obstacle at a time. And we keep repeating the experiment. And uh, then you have to explain what a really infinitely small obstacle is. Yeah, that, that that's true. Like this is kind of like assuming the thing that you do, like there is one obstacle, you do one measurement, and then everything goes back to like uh, to static situation. And then you have a new obstacle and you do a new measurement. So, so that's true. Like we cannot like handle is like many waves going at the same time. Yeah, but uh, what is an obstacle? Is it a delta function or what? Uh, yeah, yeah. So like that, the idea would now, of course, in some sense, try to be that you uh, you 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 generate like a delta delta source, and then that sends you a spherical wave that you measure. But the source is different than obstacle, right? So it's one thing to send a signal and expect to scatter from a point. It's a different thing to get signal from a point. So it's, I mean, it's getting more complicated if you want to define uh, point uh, obstacles. It's possible, but uh, in some dimension, they basically are invisible to the waves. It's related to removing uh, removable singularities and all this. You probably don't want that. Probably you want to say that you have sources randomly occurring right? yeah. instead of obstacles, which is a different thing. Yeah, th thank you. That That's true. OK. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, please, please. Uh, how much would this simplify in the case of isotropic elasticity? Uh, in isotropic elasticity, what would be then the case is that essentially, uh, well, first of all, in this in this picture, so these two guys would be the same, like the green and, and green and red line would be the same, and they all both of these would be now circles. So in an isotropic case these uh, both would be given by a Riemannian metric. So in a, if they are both Riemannian, nice Riemannian metrics, then this earlier result by uh, Günther and, and, and Slava and, and Matti would actually give the whole result. Okay. And of, of course, like just to note that this, like in isotropic case, uh, this, this Riemannian metric would be conformal uh, to Euclidean metric. So then actually, uh, even like earlier works uh, related to this powder energy problem would already determine both of them. Oh. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments? Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, if not, thank you very much, Temu, for the very interesting talk. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much.